Hello everyone, my name is Yao Li. Today I'm going to talk about our work on reasoning about the Garden of Forking Habits. This is work in collaboration with Liu Yaoxia and Stephanie Warwick. This talk is about lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation, also called by New Semantics, is an evaluation strategy that only computes what you need. It is the default evaluation strategy in some functional programming languages like Haskell. What's good about this evaluation strategy is that it allows the program to have better performance because you only compute for what you need. In addition, it also makes the programs easier to write and enables better compositionality in your programs. These are all good. However, all these good things do come with a price. In particular, the lazy evaluation makes the performance of the program hard to understand or reason about. Let me elaborate with the formula Apton function defined in Haskell. My question is, how many calls of Apton would happen to evaluate the following expression? A, three calls, B, one call, and C, zero call. A hint is that this is a trick question, and the answer is that it depends on the demands on the resulting list. And depending on the demands, all three answers are possible. In the case that every cell in the list is in the demand, we will need to call append three times. So the answer is A, three calls. In the case that only the first cell in the list is in demand, we only need to call append function once. So the answer is B, one call. And in the case the entire list is not used at all, so there is no demand, the answer is C, zero call. To make things more complicated, we cannot know the demand of something until we use them. Let's consider the following program P as an example. Assume that we first evaluate take 1xs, it will realize that we need the first cell in xs, so it computes the first cell in xs and stores the result in the memory. And then it carries on with the computation of P. Later, it realizes that we not only need the first cell of xs, we also need the second cell of it. So it retrieves the computation results we had earlier, computes the second cell of xs, and stores that in the memory again. In this way, the evaluation of the append function interleaves with the evaluation of the rest of the program, making the evaluation stateful and the performance cost of the program hard to reason about. In our work, Instead of directly dealing with the complexity of lazy semantics, we ask the following hypothetical question. What if we know the demands beforehand? First, we note that the demand is monotone, and we note that we need the first two cells of the list. We can save some steps by directly compute the first two cells. And second, we note that the evaluation order does not matter in the performance cost analysis. So, we can move the computation of the first two cells to the call set of access, just like in the call by value semantics. And this all sounds good, except for one minor problem. That is, we can't know the demand beforehand. Fortunately, we can simulate this using non-determinism. So when we evaluate access, we fork the computation into multiple different branches, each branch with a different demand. And during the evaluation of the entire program, some of these branches would result in failure because the conjecture demands on these branches are not sufficient. Eventually, one of the remaining branches would faithfully model the computation cost of a lazy program. This idea is not new. In fact, this is called the clairvoyant call by value semantics. It was proposed by Hackett and Hutton at SAFP 2019. In their paper, they define the operational and denotational semantics for the clairvoyant call by value. In our work, we further recognize and uh, encode this semantics in a monad, called the clairvoyance monad. In our work, we use the clairvoyance monad for reasoning about the computation cost of lazy programs. Our method works as formal. First, we start from a lazy and pure functional program and we do an automatic translation that translates the program into a monadic program wrapped inside the clairvoyance monad. This step achieves two things. First, 
it verifies the laziness in the original program using a strict semantics. And second, it accounts the cost of the original program and accumulates that inside the monad. And after we have these monadic programs, we can use some problem logics for reasoning about the computation cost of the original program. In our work, we implement the clairvoyance monad and the problem logics using the Galena specification language and the cock proof resistance. We do not have an automatic translator that translates a particular problem language into Galena. Instead, we develop a, a translation strategy for a lazy lambda calculus with false. This does limit our work to some extent, as we do not support features such as infinite data structures or non-structural recursion. However, many lazy data structures and algorithms actually do not rely on those features, and our framework provides a simple way for reasoning about computation cost of those programs. The key feature of our framework is its simplicity. The clairvoyance monad is very easy to define. In fact, it can be defined using around 20 lines of Galena code. And the program logics enables more general reasoning. Now, let's look at the first part of our method. Let's again use the appen function as an example. First, we translate the appen function to a function that has the following type. The first difference is that we augment all the input types of the function with a possibly undefined value. The undefined value represents that this value has not been evaluated on this branch because it is not in the demand. Furthermore, we also define, redefine list as what we call the approximation of a list. The approximation of a list also augments all the value inside it with a possibly undefined value. At last, we wrap the computation inside a monad, that is, the clairvoyant monad. What is a clairvoyant monad? We can answer this question by asking, what do we want from this monad? First, we want it to be able to accumulate a computation cost inside a program. And second, we want it to be able to model non-determinism. And finally, we want it to be able to model failures in certain non-deterministic branches. And the clairvoyance monad is the minimal implementation that implements all these three features. In fact, it is the writer monad transformer applied to the power set monad. And we can further uncarry this definition to obtain the definition as follows. We can define the following operations on the clairvoyance monad. The first the two operations are the monadic operations. In particular, binding is the operation that accumulates the cost across your program. Tick operation is the operation that increments the computation cost. Thumb and first are the operations that model non-determinism. All these operations can be defined using around 20 lines of code in Galena. Now, let's look at the appen function again and see these operations in action. First, we insert a tick operation in the head of every function body so that we can count the number of function calls as a measure of computation cost. Our next step is to make the function call recursive. After that, we want to do a pattern matching on the function's first parameter, xs. A problem here is that xs can be undefined on some branches because we conjecture that xs is not in demand on those branches. Therefore, we can apply the first operation to xs. In the case that xs is indeed, not in the, is indeed undefined, first operation will simply fill the branch. In the case that xs indeed contains some value inside it, we continue on pattern matching on the value inside it. Inside the pattern matching, in the case that xs prime is not an empty list, we want to make a recursive call. Instead of making the recursive call directly, we wrap it inside the thunk operation. What the thunk operation does is forking the computation into two different branches. It discards the computation on one branch and continues the computation on the other branch. This is a key for implementing non-determinism. In this way, the evaluation of the function becomes a garden of forking paths where different possibilities of demands are enumerated 
These are the key ideas behind the Khmer-Rhoin's monad and our transformation strategy. In the paper, we talk about the definitions of Khmer-Rhoin's monad and our transformation strategy in more detail. We also prove an equivalent theorem of our semantics with respect to the semantics of Hackett and Hatton in our paper. Now that we have imposed the computation cost of a MAZI program inside the Khmer Rhoin's monad, let's move on to talk about how we can formally reason about it. The Khmer Rhoin's monad replaces laziness with non-determinism, so we don't have to reason about laziness. But now we need to reason about non-determinism. Let's use the function p as our running example again. In the case that we have at least some demand for xs, the possible result of xs is shown as follows. How should we specify all the possible non-deterministic result of xs? The typical way of specifying a program is based on over-approximations. In this case, the over-approximation of xs is that the cost is in the range of 1 to 3. And we can apply this specification to, the, to reason about p. First, we note that uh, p require at least uh, the first two cells of the list. So we can limit the first possibility. And then we conclude that the cost of p in terms of atom is in, two, is in the range of 2 and 3. But the function p never requires the third cell of the list the xs. So the cost should never be 3. In this case, our specification failed to give us a fine upper bound for the cost of p. This is because unlike the first branch here, even though we never need the third cell of the list, providing more than was in demand would not fill the program. To get a fine upper bound of function p, we also need a way to eliminate branches with redundant steps like the third branch here. We do that by utilizing another kind of specifications specifications based on under-approximations. Let's say, if we only need the first two cells in XS, then the cost is just the two. Each kind of specification has pros and cons, so we use both of them in practice. In particular, we call the first kind of specifications the pessimistic ones, and the second kind of specification the optimistic ones. This style of reasoning based on dual specifications is also sim very similar to the reverse horror logic and incorrectness logic. Here we show one pessimistic spec and one optimistic spec for the Appen function. The pessimistic spec talks about all the possible costs, including those with redundant steps. It can be vacuum true, it can give a good lower bound than cost, but the upper bound might be coarse sometimes because of the redundant steps. On the other hand, an optimistic spec talks about some particular cases. For example, the optimistic spec we show here talks about the case that the demand is not larger than the first parameter of Appen. Compared with the pessimistic specs, an optimistic spec shows the existence of the case and it cannot be vacuously true, and it shows a good upper bound on cost. These are the key ideas behind our program logics. You can find more detail about their definitions and their reasoning rules in our paper along with some case studies on tail recursions. These are the key ideas behind our work. In the future, we would like to apply our translation strategy to tools like Haskell to Cock, so we can reason about computation cost of lazy functional data structures written in Haskell. And that concludes my talk.